Mr. Speaker. I call uh, Sua William Seo. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to acknowledge and congratulate New Zealand as we celebrate today the women's suffrage, 120 years since women were given the right to vote. Uh, today makes, marks a very powerful uh, example of the strength and power of a small nation like New Zealand doing the right thing and leading uh, the rest of the world. Um, and I think it's proper during this debate that to pay tribute to the many women who suffered physically as well as emotionally uh, during that struggle. And even today, I suspect there's still a lot of that suffering. Uh, and I think it's also important to reflect and acknowledge uh, those men, uh, husbands, uh, sons, fathers, brothers, who stood shoulder to shoulder with the women, no doubt, uh, in the struggle to try and defend and protect and advocate for this fundamental basic right. And so all those years ago and even today. And so in, in my mind, the, the struggle of women, the struggle for political freedom, the right to be able to be respected, to sit at the highest table of decision making for this country, the struggle for economic freedom where every woman uh, receives equal pay for work of equal value, the struggle for basic freedoms, uh, simple f things like the freedom to live where one wants to live, uh, or work where one wants to work, or travel where one wants to travel to, or even simple things like eating what one what's, wants. Uh, <laughs> and I think uh, for most part, women have experienced those struggles and they have a deeper understanding than most people, but I also think that the struggles are similar for Māori, Pacifica, ethnic communities, or working communities. Uh, which leads me to this debate on the 10 bills formerly part of the Family Court Proceedings Reform Bill. Uh, Mr Speaker, on the commemoration of women's suffrage, uh, this government is passing into law legislation that will again widen the gap of inequality between those who have economic and political power and those who do not. And I suspect, sir, that the, those who will suffer the greatest as a result of the injustices of the inequality uh, that these bills will throw up will be primarily women and children. Uh, the bill limits access to court-funded counselling. The bill limits access to legal aid. Uh, the bill establishes a mandatory private non-judicial process, uh, which means that the parties to the process have to meet the cost. And the costs, uh, as I understand it from the uh, recommendations from the advisers, could possibly be about 900. And I suspect if people have to pay that amount of money, then they're not going to be able to access justice. And so, the sum it all up, sir, the bill for vulnerable communities, particularly women and children and young people who may find themselves in disputes requiring legal support, legal aid, um, they will find themselves being denied the access to justice. They will find themselves uh, being outside of the door of our courts and our support. I'm, so in my electorate, we have the Mangere Community Law Centre. That centre, uh, in addition to the others who service the Manukau region, uh, experience the highest need for legal aid. And yet we see in this bill that this will limit the access of people who require support to, to aid. I mean, there's also an example, sir, of the difficulties that I foresee happening. Uh, about a week or so ago, uh, a family in Manukau were broken into uh, by police and in error. Uh, today, sir, that family is still trying to resolve that because the police uh, have failed to admit to the error that they have committed. Um, and they're still awaiting for the police to try and resolve that and pay for the damage that was caused. Now, luckily, the woman whose family this is knows a little bit about the law, so she was able to step up and say, look, somebody has done injustice to me. But I have to say that in that regard, sir, there were other families 
who the police also broke in while they were looking for the offender. The point I'm making, sir, is that a lot of vulnerable families have difficulty accessing justice at the moment. And since the government has come into power, over the years, in the last five years, we have seen cuts to funding of the sources of support that they, people would normally receive. Legal aid, for example. That's the point I'm making here, sir. That that's what this bill is going to do. It is going to uh, put more and more vulnerable communities, particularly women and children, in positions where they will need support, but they will not be able to access support. They will need legal aid, but they will not be able to access legal aid. They will need justice, but they won't be able to access justice. I'll give you another example, sir, in the Samoan world. And this is an example where, sir, the point of making is, if we're serious and genuine about supporting and giving strength to our communities, about ensuring that they have access to legal aid, to justice, to our justice system, then of course there has to be a cost to this. Of course we've got to pay for that. That's what society is about. That's what democracy is about. But I note that the government doesn't give, doesn't care, <laughs> doesn't care about it. So, and I give an example of the need for having support when people are in dispute. In the Samoan world, there are two processes that currently exist in giving support to people who are in dispute because we know that if you don't provide that kind of support, then there is going to be harm caused um, generally to those people involved. And often the breakups that occur as a result of these disputes makes it so difficult for resolution. And, 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 the, and the first example, sir, is the fautuanga matua, fautuanga ainga. That is the ability of parents, ability of elders, ability of the collective to come together and give counsel, give advice in a, in a form of a meeting to enable the disputing parties to resolve their dispute. And it doesn't matter whether it's a private matter, sir. We know that without outside and external help, those in dispute won't be able to resolve that dispute by themselves. I suppose people might recall the movie uh, Crocodile Dundee, where Crocodile Dundee says, in this small village, if one has a problem, all we've got to do is tell somebody else, and they'll tell everybody else, and, if, and very soon we won't have a problem. It might be a funny side, but there is the, the reality is, sir, the constant in the process is the need to have external assistance and support when there are parties in dispute. That's what happens in employment relationships, and it also happens in family relationships. Then there is the Ifonga in the Samoan world, sir. If you've seen the movie uh, The Orta, you've seen a little bit about that, how, how that takes place. But essentially, it is, there is a need for external assistance, whether it be legal aid, whether it be lawyers, to help resolve the dispute that occurs. If you do not have access to that kind of support, then what happens to those in dispute? People suffer. Relationships break up. Is that truly what we're about? Because this side of the house, that's not what we're about. We're about building strong, resilient communities. It only comes from strong, resilient families. And we accept that as part and parcel of ordinary life, there is always going to be dispute. And if you accept that, sir, you also, one also needs to accept that as part of the resolution, of part of the reconciliation process, of part of the healing process, there is a need for illegal aid, there is need for legal assistance, there is a need for representation, there is a need for justice, sir. And I have to say, I agree with what my colleagues have said, uh, who have spoken earlier, that this bill, as it stands, denies the basic and fundamental right for ordinary and vulnerable communities in particular to be able to access justice. And shame on this government, shame on this government, on the day as we're celebrating Women's Suffrage Day, that they, and the worst of it, sir, it's being introduced by a woman minister, Judith Collins. And I think a lot of women will be holding their heads down in shame, thinking that on this particular day when we should all be celebrating and being proud 
of our nation. Instead, this is her legacy, denying women, denying children, denying vulnerable communities access to justice. I call Colonel Judd Singh Bakshi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for this opportunity to stand and support the